All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Uh, so yeah, my name is Clement Scott. Um, I'm the I'm one of the co-founders and the creative director and basically more or less only artist of the game development studio Broken Rules, uh, based here in Vienna. Uh, we create original digital games. So that means from conception to uh, development and production up until the sales and the marketing of, of those games is, is all done in-house. Um, original, uh, or today I'm gonna talk a little bit about our four major games that we have produced in the last eight years and talk, give a little bit of an insight or an overview of how the art styles for those games came to be and a little bit what the pro process was to come up with the art style for these games. Um, I have about a billion slides, so it's gonna be uh, rather, rather fast. Um, uh, probably it will get tight towards the end, but we'll, we'll see how far I can get. All right, um, so yeah, founded in 2009. Um, so almost nine years ago by uh, these three guys originally, uh, when they released a game called And Yet It Moves, which was a 2D game where you rotate the world in order to solve puzzles, usually centered around uh, gravity and, and physics and, and things like that. Um, uh, the game, basically, when they, when they created the game, they were fresh out of university. Uh, they went to TU, so the technical university, and they were programmers and game designers, and they did not actually have an artist on this team to do the graphics. So they had to come up with a way how they could make visuals for the game without a proper artist. And I think the solution they came up with is actually pretty creative because they used photo textures and combined them with those ripped paper edges to make this papery world. And, and while the style might be considered a little bit crude or, or a little bit uh, funky, I th still think it's, it's super unique and it has a good sense for, for aesthetics. It definitely helped stick out of the crowd. Um, only a little bit later, Martin and I joined the team and in 2010, uh, with the revenue of uh, And Yet It Moves and the uh, uh, public grant from the Vienna Business Agency, um, we were able to start working on uh, the, our two next games um, for the following four years. And uh, the first one was a, uh, was a game called Chasing Aurora, which uh, came out on the Nintendo Wii U and in, in November 2012 and basically was a local multiplayer game where birds chase each other around. Um, uh, following up, two years later in 2014, we released a, a follow-up game, or the second game to this one, set in the same universe called Secrets of Raticon, which was a single-player game where you fly around as this weird, mysterious bird human being through this um, alpine landscape and try to uncover the mysteries of this world. Um, the game was heavily inspired by, by the Alps, the second one specifically by the, by the Retikon at the border between Austria and Switzerland, and uh, by its harsh beauty, essentially. And we wanted to combine that with sort of the mysterious uh, tribal uh, customs of, of various cultures all over the world. Um, when we started out working on the game, it actually looked like this. Um, so it, it didn't have, have those visuals you saw before, it was just prototype art. And this is often what games look like when you start out working on them, because you're trying to figure out what the gameplay is going to be like. You're trying to figure out what it feels like to play this game. So essentially what we had were these little boxes right here, and they represented our bird people flying around, and we had those lines here and here that represented uh, sort of these wind streams those birds would kind of like glide along on. And, um, and I had to figure out an art style for this. What was the game going to look like? Our only constraints were it was going to be set in the Alps, and it was about mysterious bird people and really not much else you know and 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 we didn't have any proper constraints we didn't really have a, a a solid vision of what the game was actually going to be how all the parts would fit together 
uh, which made the development um, actually quite difficult, especially finding an art style for me quite difficult because I tried tons of different things, all these experiments in, in, in sort of like usually digital media, just building stuff, drawing stuff, testing things, and nothing ever really clicked. And it took like already way too long to figure out the art style. And at some point I just got frustrated and uh, decided to take a break from the project. And uh, I was at home and through a happy accident, I guess you could say, with my wardrobe. I had an old big wooden wardrobe that just one day fell apart. I found out that it had really nice wooden shelves inside. And um, more out of kind of getting, getting my head free, I started drawing on these shelves with black marker, uh, which ended up in this image, uh, which was the, actually the, the first concept art for the game. And, uh, uh, and, but that was more like an, an, an happy accident instead of like a proper uh, uh, you know, way of designing things where you know what you're doing. Um, so I essentially just started like cross-hatching things on, on the board and kind of like the landscape developed a little bit and I never really intended to draw a landscape, but that's sort of what happened. And only at the very end, I actually put in those birds. And um, also like the whole geometric triangular style um, mostly happened because I left out triangular shaped spaces in here because I was too lazy to fill them with cross hatches. Um, and that sort of like uh, started the whole series of, of these boards and I started cutting them apart in different shapes and drawing on them. And I put on them like a whole bunch of um, these alpine uh, animals. And that's sort of what, what, what kicked off the whole idea of what this game was going to look like. And uh, bringing this into a game uh, turned out to be uh, a challenge. The look went through many iterations and many adaptions just because of the nature of the real-time nature of games. And um, uh, you, you have to uh, uh, basically go with certain uh, technical limitations that you have of things that you can do and can't do. And, um, but it was a good base to work with. In the end, both games turned out to not do as well as we had hoped, financially nor critically. And we basically were at the point of uh, closing down the studio because uh, we ha didn't have any budget left um, and uh, we were kind of, from, from all these years of working on these games, uh, we were just drained and exhausted. Uh, but we decided to keep on trucking and picked up some, some work for hire and restructured the company a little bit. And one year later, in, in 2015, a new opportunity opened up to, to work uh, on, our new or, on a new original game. And uh, that game was called Old Man's Journey, which should, yeah, there we go, here it is. And uh, Felix and I started working on this game and it sort of was, for me, it was sort of my last shot at making my own games because we had been around for so many years. We weren't really making any money. Uh, we were living basically our, our creative dream of, of making our own games. Uh, but this was kind of it. It was sort of the thing, okay, I'm going to do that. And after that, we're just going to close down the studio. Um, but we also decided we wanted to take all the lessons that we had learned in the previous four years and put that into the game. And, and one of those were that we wanted, we wanted a very, very clear vision of what this game was going to be. And in short, Old Man's Journey is a 2D puzzle game for, for mobile, so for tablets and, uh, um, and phones. Uh, it's also out on, on PC, however, and on the Nintendo Switch by now. Um, and uh, it's, it's basically a game about this old man living alone on a, on a house, on a in a house on a cliff, and one day he receives a letter. And upon re reading that letter, he just packs his things and starts to walk. And players do not know why. So at the end of each level, he sits down, because he's an old man and he needs to rest, and he's thinking back on his life and uh, is remembered as one of the key moments in his life. Um, for example, here is when, when he had his girlfriend and they went on a road trip together. And the whole story of the game is just told in these single images. Um, there is no text in the game, there are, there are no voiceovers, uh, um, so the whole story is only told visually. 
And uh, we wanted to build this really kind of like slow paced uh, game with this, with this very personal and, and, and emotional narrative. And um, in, this, in this sort of rich interactive world where people just would want to spend time in or when you showed it to somebody where people would, you know, potentially would want to go on a vacation in. And um, this is what we did. Uh, the game itself works by guiding the old man through shaping the landscape. So wherever you touch a hill, you can drag it. And wherever two hills create an intersection, the old man can actually switch from one hill to the other. So no matter how far that hill is away. And around this mechanic, there are all these kinds of different puzzles built around on how to guide him. Um, so, but here's, here's one of the screenshots, for example, from, from the start of the game. Um, and again, when we started out working on it, it didn't look like this. It actually looked like this. It was just these gray shapes that you could already shape. You had this um, uh, pink playing figure and a blue flag as a goal. And we needed to figure out all of these things, not only what it was going to look like, but also how to communicate certain things. It was just one screen and we had, uh, uh, there was no kind of like moving camera or anything like that. It was just one single puzzle. And one of the goals, for example, was to exchange that blue flag with something else, something that would clearly communicate to players that this is where they needed to go. At the same time, we needed to figure out what this would look like. And um, coming from a, from a sort of like uh, having done a lot of vector work before, uh, my first attempt was to kind of like make a vector version of this and just put some colors on it and see where it would go. And while it, communi it communicated certain things that I liked, we felt that you know, it didn't support the, the emotional notes of the game that we wanted to have because it was just a little bit too cold and too, too geometrical. So I decided to take a more, tried a more uh, painterly attempt with some more textures in it. And I took the second level where the mechanic of waterfalls are introduced. So this, these blue lines here, this is a waterfall. If the figure, if the old man walks into the waterfall, he falls down, lands on the bottom layer and can, can walk to the goal. And I painted on top of that and came up with this. And found the results eh, rather not so uh, uh, convincing. And at this point, I was kind of like, OK, maybe I have to try something completely different. I was going to be the main artist on the game with the support uh, of, of two others. But it had to be a style that I would feel comfortable in, that I could do for like the whole game, for all these levels, work on a year on it. And so I thought, OK, maybe I take a different approach and try to make it in, work in 3D and see what happens then. And so in Blender, I put, put the scene together. And there were certain things that we really liked, others that we didn't. Um, essentially, like we really liked the colors. We didn't so much like the low polygon look of it. Um, and, and again, tried to come from a different angle to, to solve these problems. So for example, one other problem was that uh, we didn't know if the old man was jumping very far into the landscape and there were really long distances, the old man would get really small and you couldn't see him anymore. So we had to figure out like how far could we go. And we decided to come up with another screen where we could test out these distances more. So I went back to this screen again, built it in 3D and came up with this. And uh, again, we really liked a couple of things, especially like the, the lights and the colors and um, uh, it, it introduced one of the rules of the art style that fo actually follows until the final game, which is that there are always um, uh, gradients from top to bottom with slight hue shifts at the bottom. So here you can see it nicely on the top. It's yellow. It turns to uh, orange and then goes into this slightly greenish tone. And this is actually something that, that we took along for, for the rest. And to solve the, the problem of what we call signposting, so to inform players where they need to go into the game, I tried to put this little uh, village on the hillside instead of the blue flag, because it was the only really prominent thing there. So players would tend to just experiment and try to go there. So um, here the problem was that it still lacked like the, the, the richness that we wanted in the world. We wanted to feel it alive and have all these like little details. And I'm just not a really good 3D modeler. And I'm not really fast either, and we didn't have a good model at hand at this point. So we had to figure something else out. And I went back to what I usually do, which is line drawing. So I took the same scene and said, OK, this is only about putting details in the scene. 
and I liked it, put some colors on it, and this was the, whoa, whoa, what just happened? That was, uh-huh, okay. Wow, uh, there we go, that was the result. Okay, um, and I went a little bit overboard with the details almost, but I really liked a few of the things because you, when you see them, you can already like imagine those little sheep running around and there are these, there are these guys picking the grapes of the vines and they would put them in the baskets and just walk around and you could have all these like little elements and this is sort of, this is what I wanted to achieve, right? Um, but on the other hand, the outlines felt like everything was looking a little bit too cartoonish and a little bit not exactly what we wanted. So um, I had to try something else again. <laughs> and um, so my next logical step was, well, if, if the village in this level is, is the goal, the next level would be inside that village, right? So what would that look like? And how could we make that happen with the existing prototype test levels that we had? And there was this prototype level, and here the players learn two things. One of the things is that the hill the player is standing on can't be shaped. It can't be moved. And uh, the second one is that there are solid things that never can be shaped. So these dark gray shapes right here are just solid blocks that are solid. So the solution to this level is that the player has to walk over there on that solid block. Then they can move up that hill, create an intersection, walk up, and get to the goal of the level. And I thought, well, these solid blocks, you know, if we're talking about being in a village, maybe they are houses. And again, I sketched on top of that and came up with a couple of, uh, you know, reference images of, of sort of like Mediterranean villages. I came up with this sketch and, and I kind of liked it. But this level also needed some sort of signposting again to tell the players where they needed to go. So I decided to extend that sketch to the, to the top and to the bottom a little bit. So uh, people would walk up and when they land at this spot at the hotel, it's very obvious that they are at at their goal because there's no really other way to go any further. They already know that old man needs to take breaks. There's a hotel, perfect. Um, so basically, next step was to put down some colors again and decide for a palette. So I created this, this quick thumbnail and um, uh, we really, at this point, it already kind of like clicked. This is where, like, in terms of, 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 of vibe, this is sort of where we wanted to go. And one other challenge, for example, was to, to create a, an environment that is believable and, and, and realistic, but at the same time, we needed those, those hills that you can shape, they needed to be uh, readable very clearly uh, when you saw them, so you know which parts are gameplay elements and which parts are just decoration, right? So I introduced kind of like these, these magical colors for the hills, like the blues and, and, and the reds, which is something that ground usually doesn't necessarily have. Uh, but it's, it stayed within the same, same overall palette, so it's, it worked. Um, I started detailing this. There we go, a little bit, and, and putting some, some texture on it, and came up with this, essentially. That was the result. And that was the first, first concept art, really, for, for the game and for the look of the game. And we were fairly happy with that. But we didn't know how would we put that in the game. Like, uh, because we had been experimenting with 3D or not, maybe, you know, uh, since we now had, like, a moving camera that moved up and down, you could have nice sort of, like, you know, get a nice uh, perspective effect when the camera moves over the environment. So the 3D approach was very tempting and we started to experiment a lot with that stuff. Um, so the first thing was that I built those, those I just took three, three houses from that scene and built them in 3D to figure out, to put it into the game and see what would it look like. And actually we were, we were pretty happy with the results and most of the team was leaning towards going with the 3D option. Um, but I felt I wasn't giving the 2D version a fair chance because there was much less detail in it than in the 3D options where you have all these kind of like bushes and the satellite dish and the little plants and stuff like that that this scene was lacking. So I went back to the 2D version and, and created a more detailed version of that and uh, which ended up like this, which is almost what it actually looks like in-game now. And uh, we decided to go for the 2D version, essentially. But in reality, when you look at the scene in the editor, it actually looks like this. So um, 
it is actually in some way it is 3D because all those layers are stacked on top of each other in, into the distance, right? And this stacking of layers was actually another step in defining the rules of the overall art style. There is another level, ex for example, it looks like this. So uh, here you can see like the, how the old, whole art style is based on that idea that everything is flat and stacked on top of each other. And that was taken into, into account when, when creating the art assets for it. So, for example, like the best example of this is a single bush, which basically is just a silhouette, this shape in one color. And then with the rule applied on top, we have a little bit of uh, lighter color and the hue shift on the bottom as well into, a, into something darker, but it's still pretty flat. And then we put, an, uh, put another layer on top of that uh, with the same rules, another layer on top of that, and the bush is done, essentially. And there's no, no you know, feeling of volume in this or anything. It's still very flat, but it is sort of a convincing bush. <laughs> um, so I don't know how much time do I have left? A few minutes. A few minutes. OK, <laughs> nice. All right. Whew. Let's keep on going. Um, what followed, basically, was um, how we came up with uh, the, the decoration for the levels was by stitching together screenshots of the level. So what, what happens is you uh, go to a certain point in the level and the camera is there and then you can walk around in this portion of the level. Once you move to the screen, the camera moves to a second point and then you move around there and that's sort of like how you progress all the time. And so we took these camera views, put them in a Photoshop file and stitched them together and started painting or drawing on top of that. Um, and each level, I can maybe show this really quick. Let's step through here really quick. Right, there we go. These are a few of the levels. And each of the levels follows um, a certain, um, how you say, sort of like a certain emotional uh, progression in the game. The whole game has one, emo what you call the um, emotional progression curve that everything in the, in the game is, is aligned to. And ideally, that we want players to feel when they play the game. So all the visuals, all the audio, even like the puzzles, the gameplay, the, 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 the level design, everything follows this emotional curve of the narrative, essentially, to support that narrative. Because the game is essentially tell, uh, about telling that story. So, and, and, and everything is just there to support that. Um, and so in this level, for example, um, it is at the curve is at a point where it's going downwards, actually. So on, uh, more to the, to the top, there are kind of like positive and happy emotions. And when it goes down, it's, uh, it's more, more sad, melancholic, or, or, or uh, kind of uh, more bad things are happening, essentially. And in this level, um, this is a, a sort of like a transitional level where the, the theme is everything is going down. So he starts at the top, and on the top there are still some warmer, brighter colors, and as he moves through the level downwards, uh, everything gets a little bit more cold, and uh, in the end he ends up falling into that pond and drowning. Um, but it's not over at this point. <laughs> Don't worry, it, it goes on, the game goes on. Um, so. Yeah, that's pretty much it, actually. I think I, I, I went through all the slides. Amazing. <laughs> wow. OK, yeah. Um, I hope this gave you like, a little bit of an overview into, into, into in the process that we have when, when making art for our games. We feel that every game needs its own art direction to support the overall vision of that game. Whatever you're trying to do when you create something, and I think that goes for for all kinds of different things, whatever you are, are creating, it, there's this one kind of like purpose that you're trying to achieve. And uh, uh, our philosophy is that we would like to, to align all the elements, all the parts that go into make to, to, to achieving that vision uh, have, to, have to support that. So we tend to make ourselves uh, very specific constraints that, uh, we can, that is more like a, a checklist or like a tool set where whenever we are trying to make a decision, we can go back to that, to that tool set and see, okay, does it align with these points that we have in mind for, for the overall game? If it does, uh, it's great, let's put it in, let's see how it works with the other parts and, and so forth. It's a very big iterative process and we learn a lot with every project that we make, but uh, we found that this is a 
technique that works very well for us. Um, so yeah, lastly, I uh, wanted to, to add that we have our offices in or our office in the Museumsquartier in uh, the seventh district, and we also have a couple of free tables. And we are also always looking. Uh, we're not really like a, a co-working space, but basically we we have a few free tables that we rent out, and uh, we like to have more people in our office. So if you are also looking for a space to work, you can just uh, contact me and uh, ask me, and uh, we can we can talk about it. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is our email address. This is my personal uh, address. This is our Twitter handle. I did, forgot to put my email address on there if you want to get in contact with me. It's just Clemens at Broken Rules. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>